Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, Liquidware, the innovator in adaptive workspace management solutions, and also brought to you by Policy Pack Software, now part of Netrix, where you use Group Policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And the show is, of course, also brought to you by ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work-from-anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. Apologies for what I assume is going to be quite different audio this week. I'm traveling for work to the U.S., and it is pollen season, so I think (laughs) I'm having allergies, or at least I hope it's allergies. So I'm quite congested, so apologies, but I didn't want to miss an episode this week, so we're just going to plow on and get through it. So with that, let's get into some news. There were some pretty big developments with Windows 365 announced recently. There are plans to integrate the cloud PCs directly into Windows 11, meaning you'll be able to jump into your virtual Windows 10 or Windows 11 desktops via the new desktops feature in the operating system. And The Verge reports we will even be able to boot our PCs directly into cloud PCs. The narrative or pitch is that this could be perfect for hybrid workers As with Windows 365, they would always connect to the same persistent one-to-one virtual desktop, no matter where they are. Also talked about again, or at least this time officially announced by Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, is the idea of a Windows 365 offline feature, which allows you to continue working on your cloud PC even when offline by using a local version. And then when you get back online again, it will sync your session data to the online instance. This is something I mentioned on the podcast before as it was previously discussed by Microsoft Scott Manchester a few months ago on their podcast. Windows 11 is also going to get a native Windows 365 app. So if you'd like to launch using a dedicated app, it sounds like that will be possible in the future. And this will allow Windows 11 users to power up a cloud PC from the taskbar or start menu without having to head into a browser or presumably into the RDP client too. So all very positive developments. The offline feature in particular interests me. I'd love to see how it actually works in reality. Much of these features are things that Citrix accomplished previously too, but obviously since Microsoft owns the operating system, they can roll these features right in and make them more prominent and seamless, which again, as I've said before on the podcast, maybe begs the question about some anti-competition practices. I wonder how the likes of VMware will feel about this. Like, Should that ability to add desktops directly in the Windows 11 operating system Should that have an option to also directly launch Horizon desktops too, as an example? Maybe it will in the future. Who knows? I guess we'll have to wait and see. One thing is for sure, though, the fact that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella was the one making these announcements and that seemingly features for Windows 365 are being built into the operating system now means Microsoft are placing high visibility on the product. So I guess we'll all have to watch this space for these features to be rolled out in the coming months. On a recent episode, I covered the upcoming tabs feature for Windows 11 Explorer. Well, The Verge reports that Microsoft is also adding a new File Explorer homepage that includes the typical quick access folders, recent documents, and a new favorites option. You'll soon be able to right click a file to add it to favorites and then it will appear pinned on the home page of File Explorer. There are even improved sharing options for files with an updated share dialog that lets you send to recent contacts or apps like Teams, Outlook, and OneDrive as examples. I don't believe the favorites ability and the sharing ability or the improved sharing is in any of the preview builds just yet, so it remains to be seen when these will be available to users. 
And just quickly before I move on from Windows 11 for this episode, windowscentral.com reported this week that a Steam survey, which is the gaming service, showed that 16.84% of their users are now running Windows 11. Windows 10 is still dominant amongst their users with almost 75% of the share. So not a huge amount for Windows 11 yet, but as it's still relatively new, it sure seems to be trending upwards. Not surprising considering the fact that Windows 10 users have been getting prompted to upgrade to Windows 11. It should probably be even higher. Microsoft also announced an auto patch feature for Windows that they claim should enable IT pros to do more for less. Microsoft's E3 customers will be able to use the feature at no additional cost. They say that with auto patch, patch Tuesdays will be just another Tuesday and say, hey, why not even just take the day off as the patching will be completed automatically. I think they're pretty ambitious with those statements. Um, It appears auto patch will use the Microsoft update cadence that they've been talking about for several years now or theory with their concept of having separate rings. So initially patching will occur on 1% of devices then 9%, and finally the remaining 90% or the broad ring. If no issues are reported or detected by the assessment feature in the auto patch service, the service then moves on to the next ring for patching. You'll be able to set the rings to more conservative or aggressive if you like. So I guess you could have it patch the 1% and then Two days later, patch the 9%, and then two days later, patch the remaining 90% if you'd like. They did not say in the demo if it will be possible to determine which devices are in each ring, but I hope so, and I assume so. It appears this will only be for endpoints managed via the cloud, so with Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And what they stepped through in the demo, it looks like all you will need to do really is go into Microsoft Endpoint Manager and check a box to enable the feature. Then decide which devices you want Microsoft to automatically patch. Personally, I didn't really have problems managing the actual patching itself. Other than patching maybe Citrix images or Horizon desktops, which obviously even with this service, that's not going to change just by the nature of image updates. It has always been more of a stress to me that patches might break something. So maybe the assessment capabilities after the patches have been deployed to the rings might be of interest. But what they were selling or pitching in the video that I watched on this auto patch feature, it was more around, oh, you know, you spend so long planning and um, sifting through the patches and all that. Well, in reality, I never really did. I always had my own kind of update cadence. I didn't use multiple different sets of rings, like three or four different sets of rings. I only used a pilot group and then a production group. So I don't really see a huge time save for me and how I've been doing things in the past in terms of the management of the patching. But I guess in particular for remote endpoints, this should provide some extra visibility and reassurances that those devices will get patched, I hope. In a quick story, there is now a group policy template for managing Windows Package Manager. It includes settings for setting the default package source, setting a list of allowed sources, enabling app installer, and more. So if you want to use Windows Package Manager, check that out. On April 5th, it was reported that 400 Atlassian customers experienced a service outage with Jira Software, Jira Work Management, Jira Service Management, Confluence, Ops Genie Cloud, Status Page, and Atlassian Access, all listed as affected. In pretty disappointing news for customers, the vendor has now communicated that a full restoration could take a further two weeks. ZDNet reports that the company mobilized hundreds of engineers to work around the clock to resolve the outage. In order to get customers back up and running though, a complex rebuild process must be completed. On April 11th, it was indicated that they had rebuilt functionality for over 35% of the affected customers with no reported data loss. 
So obviously very frustrating for those customers who are currently down from these services, but it sounds like at least when they're rebuilt and brought back up, it should be business as usual. And there was a bit of chatter on Twitter, like, could this potentially be the longest running outage of all time? From what I remember, Nuance Dragon 1, I think it was, which is Nuance's cloud dictation service, was hit with ransomware a few years ago. And one of the most critical pieces of the product is their dictionary, which was completely online. And from what I remember, that was actually down for months. So yeah, two weeks is bad, but I don't think it's as bad as what Nuance had experienced. But hey, I stand for correction though. So if anyone knows, hit me up on Twitter. Maybe it wasn't as long as my memory thinks it was. According to Hacker News, VMware has released security updates to patch eight vulnerabilities spanning its products, some of which could be exploited to launch remote code execution attacks. Tracked from CVE-2022-22954 to 22961, the scores in severity range from 5.3 to 9.8. Obviously, with 10 being the highest severity, that 9.8 is particularly concerning. And some of the products affected include VMware Workspace One Access, VMware Identity Manager, vRealize Automation, Cloud Foundation, and the vRealize Suite Lifecycle Manager. Five of the eight bugs are rated critical, two are rated important, and one is rated moderate in severity. Unfortunately, in the high severity, which I believe is in the Workspace One product, Hackers could potentially gain root access if they exploit the vulnerability, and VMware recommends patching or mitigating immediately. A couple of weeks ago, Google released an emergency patch to patch a single vulnerability, which is out of the ordinary for them. Well, now Google has released another patch for another single vulnerability, so I guess just like a bus, you wait forever for one to come and then two come at once. The CVE for this is CVE-2022-1232. And unfortunately, continuing on with their run of form for this sort of thing, Google has not disclosed any deep technical details just yet. So just ensure you are up to date with your browser. Also, if you're using a Chromium browser like Edge, good idea to make sure that's up to date too. And speaking of Edge, on a previous episode of the podcast, I discussed the sleeping tabs feature in the browser for preserving your machine's resource utilization when using the browser. Well, now Microsoft have announced that, quote, beginning in Microsoft Edge 100, we've updated sleeping tabs to enable pages that are sharing a browsing instance with another page to now go to sleep. And with this change, 8% more tabs on average will sleep saving you even more resources. On average, each sleeping tab saves 85% of memory and 99% CPU for Microsoft Edge, end quote. So obviously, Chrome has had a reputation for a long time of being a bit of a resource hog. So this is a very positive development. And I had covered on the podcast before that Microsoft's development team for Edge was working pretty closely with Google's on optimizing the browser in general. So what's being seen today in Edge will hopefully also roll back to the actual Chromium code base too. On last week's episode of the podcast, I covered new developments from Citrix, including the move to Citrix DAS rather than CVAN Citrix Cloud and some of their other new features too. Well, I guess at the time of the recording, they hadn't yet finished their announcements for the week as they went on to also announce that Citrix app delivery and security service is now generally available. In the announcement, they explained that the service provides a simpler management interface for Citrix ADCs, along with easy implementation of security features and analytics. It provides the benefits of a SaaS for management with the bonus of having the actual product within the tenant to ensure it can take advantage of all the features available. So it kind of reads like uh, ADM mixed with a little bit of Citrix Analytics. So I'd be interested to check it out. 
The awesome Patrick Coble, who you can follow on Twitter, at VDI Hacker, warned that he's seen the most Citrix security alerts in one day. These were 7814 Storefront, Need SAML Session, 0551 Zen Mobile, Need Access or Admin, 0550-SD-WAN, Access to Session or Admin, 1455 Gateway Older Plugin plus Access to Client with no RCE, I believe Remote Code Execution, need access in the right situation. He warns that SAML storefront administrators should check this out. So certainly worrying activity. Hopefully this doesn't lead to something very damaging. Recently, the BBC reported that Google have removed more than a dozen apps from the store for secretly copying users' phone numbers. The report states that one such app was a QR code and barcode scanner app, which had been downloaded more than 5 million times. The app was secretly sending users sensitive data, including their phone's unique IMEI identification number to a company based in Panama named Measurement Systems and tracked back to a company in Virginia, US called Vostrom Holdings. This is a pretty topical story given John Oliver just did a deep dive episode into data brokers this week, which I strongly recommend you check out on YouTube. I'll share a link to that as well with this episode, which is episode 225. And you'll find that at fivebytespodcast.com under reference links for this episode, or you may find a link to it in the description field of your podcast platform of choice. Fortune had an article this week that covered a survey or results of a survey from over 3,000 US managers with the conclusion that 77% say that they'd fire you or cut your pay for not coming back to the office. So I can't help but read this headline and react to it. And while the article is a little on the provocative side too, I'd bet in reality the questions were probably less definitive than the article suggests. If over three quarters of managers surveyed really think they are, if over three quarters of managers surveyed really think that they'll just lay off staff who prefer to work from home, I think they're in for a rude awakening. I was at the EUC master's retreat this weekend talking to a lot of different people and even those offering remote work opportunities are finding it quite difficult to hire right now i think back in january the u.s had like an unemployment of 3.9 percent so pretty close to full employment i think those managers need to wake up to reality that right now this is an employee's market and if you're not going to offer remote work you're going to be left in the dirt To wrap up the news this week, there was a really fascinating article by Times that detailed some of the efforts made by a tech team keeping the internet going in Ukraine and also repurposing a widely used public services app for more useful features during this wartime. The popular Kiev digital smartphone app, which residents previously used to pay utility bills and parking tickets, now gives them a map of the closest bomb shelters and places to get critical supplies like insulin, food, or gasoline. Notifications for the closure of a local metro stop for repairs have given way to warnings of incoming air raids. The report also details what they did to ensure uh, internet services for the community, including those who were down in bomb shelters where you you think that would be impossible to get connectivity and i love this quote because my buddy trent ty and i spoke at hymns just a few weeks ago in orlando and the theme of our session was around something that michael ryan dr michael ryan of the world health organization said at the beginning of the pandemic around the fact that speed trumps perfection in emergency response You know, don't hesitate, don't try to get things perfect, because if you do, then the virus has a chance to kind of catch up and overwhelm you. Uh, Well, Victoria Iskovic, who serves as Kiev's deputy IT director, had a really awesome quote in this article, 
which I'd like to read for you. And that's, quote, The main thing I've learned during this time is that there is no point in striving for the perfect solution. The best product is the one you can launch here and now, end quote. So obviously, if you're bringing a product to market just in like normal, stable circumstances, you'd probably don't want to do that. Although <laughs> some vendors uh, rely on the general public for doing their testing for them, it seems. But I thought this was an incredible quote and it kind of lines up with what IT experienced during the pandemic and rushing people to go work from home. And now obviously this is applying to their situation in Ukraine, which is much more grave than what most of us experienced when just trying to get people to work from home during the pandemic. But kudos to them. It's incredible that they've been able to do this. I think in the article, they also said that their team became kind of like a startup company during these operations. It's just a really great read. I suggest you check it out and I'll share a link to that with this episode, which again is episode 225. And now this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. I saw that Alex Durant blogged about keeping your Intune base apps evergreen, leveraging the evergreen module. And I've talked about the module quite a bit on this podcast in the past. It's really awesome. So for an easy to use guide and how to integrate it into your workflows and deployments for Microsoft Endpoint Manager, check out this blog. Adam Juliak tweeted an update to a story that I covered on a previous episode of the podcast, but he states that the latest cumulative update for server 2022 seems to fix the branch cache issue for a Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. Man, I've lost count of the amount of times Windows updates have borked the branch cache feature. The awesome Jen gentleman who's one of the best tech follows on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, give her a follow. Uh, but she shared, did you know that the clock app on Windows has an awesome grid view for comparing time zones? I did not know that. And I work with teams dispersed across the world. So that would have been really handy to know over the years. I'm glad I know it now. Mike Kranikos shared a deep dive session or a recording of a deep dive session. The video is on YouTube on Windows Terminal. So I know that Guy Leach was talking about the Windows Terminal at the Master's Retreat this weekend. I really like it, but mostly just because I can customize the backgrounds and it gives me a good feeling when I'm working in my own custom environment or custom command windows. And the fact that you're able to just open tabs within a single app for various different interfaces. But yeah, if you haven't checked out Windows Terminal or maybe you already have and you'd like to review a deep dive to learn about things maybe you missed and just pick up some tips and tricks, uh, check out this video. So it's a little late now for this next one, which is why I didn't put in a weekly webinar. I'm not sure if there's going to be a recording available. I hope there is, but I saw that Suse are running a Kubernetes masterclass on Tuesday, April 12th at 8 a.m. Pacific. Tessa Davis, which is Tessa R. Davis on Twitter, had a really great Twitter thread explaining advanced Twitter search capabilities. So I've said it a few times, I think on this podcast and also at events, but Twitter is probably one of my most useful resources in terms of research, not only for this podcast, but just ongoing for IT in general. Uh, There's a really great community for EUC on Twitter. So if you're not on Twitter, join and just follow a lot of people in EUC and you'll always be kept up to date. And I talked about the EUC Masters Retreat quite a few times during this episode. Uh, It's over for this year, but definitely get your butt in gear to come to the event next year. There's so much great content and most of all, excellent networking opportunities for the community. Uh, But I saw that Mike Streets tweeted about a session that I didn't get to attend, and he said something pretty interesting. He said that they were dropping some FS Logic's truth bombs And that Azure Files has a 2,000 handle limit, which means a maximum of 1,000 concurrent logons if you want to live dangerously. He says, scale out, not up. 
you need more handles for more users, not more IOPS. So very interesting. I never deployed FS logics at that large of a scale, so it's not a limit that I've hit. But if you work in a large enterprise environment, then that's definitely one worth knowing. Well, that's it for this episode. I'm hoping that from next week, I'll go back to the normal type of schedule, which would be putting it out around the end of the week. But until then, stay safe all, and thank you so much for listening.